awesome. Come on, it's good to be with you guys. Let's all welcome it here in back of it. Let's welcome Napa campus, the prison campuses tonight. Everybody outside this room, we love you. We're glad you're with us tonight. And uh, man, just a special night. So Pastor Dave and Donna this weekend are down with our OC family preaching at TFH OC tomorrow morning. And so they're gonna be partying down there with Pastors Matt and Bianca. It's just, uh, wish, let's all just go down there and just overwhelm them, shall we? That'd be fun. Uh, but man, we have a, just extreme honor tonight of having a good friend of the house with us. Uh, Jedediah Thurner is the executive director of an organization called Missions Me. And what they're doing in the nations of the earth is, is uh, really unprecedented. Uh, just amazing outreaches and the organization of what they're doing uh, is just, I'm not even gonna try to explain it. It's just world changing for sure. And something coming up this summer, he's gonna tell you a little bit about it, uh, is this summer they're doing One Day LA, where they're gonna overwhelm the whole LA area, outreaches, uh, just amazing stuff. He's gonna share a little bit about that, but uh, as your leadership and Pastor Dave uh, just really wants to resound with this uh, this weekend is, we're gonna go big on this. We're gonna get behind this because we believe God is doing something unprecedented in California. And as the Father's house, now with representation all up and down the state, we will not be left out of it. So we're excited, uh, but not just about that. We're excited because Jedediah has got just an amazing heart for revival and just a move of God. And so we're, we're in for a treat. Before he comes, why don't you just check out this brief video and then we're gonna go nuts and welcome him tonight. From now until July, we're calling 20,000 team members from around the world to provide the greatest display of love Los Angeles has ever experienced. Our goal will be to invest 1 million hours of service and sustainable solutions to those who need it most. Envision hundreds of teams partnered with local LA nonprofits who are already impacting their communities. Our team's goal will be to magnify and multiply their efforts in each community. In the months before One Day LA, local churches and organizations will transform into serve centers. Prep teams will collect data, assess needs, and strategically plan intelligent outreach in preparation for the hundreds of teams arriving in July. Then from July 19th to 26th, each one of the more than 300 teams will focus on specific communities for six days. They'll partner with local nonprofits, businesses, and government programs, and together facilitate aid distribution, community festivals, beautification projects, sports camps, and homeless outreach. Each team member will be equipped with an outreach mobile application to record details on every family for further aid distribution and follow-up. Our dream is to provide real solutions through outrageous acts of love, service, and community relationships. It all leads to a moment where we will unite the city alongside influencers, community leaders, artists, and inspiring voices at the LA Memorial Coliseum to celebrate what the love of Jesus can do. Here are the three ways you can show your love for LA. First, love acts. Join this historic team by committing to serve Los Angeles. Love gives. Raise funds or donate goods to generously provide for people who desperately need it. Lastly, love speaks. Tell everyone, invite others to go or give. Bring them into the story. Every team member, every gift, and every share counts. So take your next step at onedayla.com. Come on, would you stand to your feet here and at all locations? Let's give a Father's House welcome to Jedediah Thurner. Come on. Thank you, thank you. Hey, while you're standing, can we just put our hands for Jesus one last time? Come on, can we just continue to set the atmosphere of expectation? Come on, if you got a reason to be thankful, if you got a reason to be grateful, if God's done anything good in your life, come on, if you're not who you used to be, if he's changed you, if he saved you, come on, Father's house, let's just give him a loud, audacious, irrational, unconditional, illogical shout of praise. Come on. Man, I am evidently excited uh, to be here, and it's such an honor. Why don't you, I, I still got the mic, I didn't say you could sit down, you gotta do what I'm saying, just stand. I'm just messing with you. Why don't you turn to two to three people quickly while you grab your seat, just let them know how good you look and how good they look. Go ahead and get comfortable. Thank you, band, for doing such an incredible job. Man, it is such an honor and a privilege. How many are just so excited about what God is doing right here? I mean, this is a Saturday night service. Come on, somebody. 
Anyone just so excited to be a part of a church that's alive, that's real, that's relevant, that's reaching people? Uh, I, I walked in and I looked at uh, one of the pastors and I said, uh, can this just be my church? Can I just, can we relocate? Can we just relocate right here? And uh, it is such an honor and a privilege to be with you and just such a, a privilege to stand on a platform that I did not invest in or build. And we're all here today because of some outrageous leaders who, uh, who sacrificed everything to say, hey, we're going to go to maybe where there isn't a church like this and what started in a home that's now grown to multiple campuses. I don't know if you guys know what you're a part of, but next week, you know you guys are launching Oakland? Come on, somebody. Do you know next month you're launching Natomas? You're already in five prisons, but you might not know this, but Pastor Raymond got permission. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some secrets. He got permission to go to all 35 prisons in the state of California. Come on, for those watching live at Napa and tomorrow at Roseville in the East Bay, come on, we just put our hands together. It's because of the incredible leadership of Pastor Dave and Donna and pretty much who I want to look like when I grow up. And uh, the family that we inspire to have, you have some of the most outrageous, incredible leaders on the planet. Can we just honor them one more time? And, yeah, they're just the best. You know, I, I got a word uh, for you guys tonight, and, uh, but before I do, Pastor Dave did ask just to share a little bit about what God's doing one day LA, and it's evident, I think, with what's taking place right here in this house, that as we step into this new decade, as we step into 2020, that God is actually giving birth to something brand new on this planet, that I actually believe if I could just share with you what I sense in my spirit, that God has accelerated the timeline on America, that he's making an aggressive move in the state of California and in this entire nation. And, and One Day LA is really just one of the many things that God's doing right now in this brand new era of ministry as we enter into this new decade. And if you think about the incredible narrative that God is writing, 2020 is an election year. And hate has become front and center stage, and soon racial divide will begin to dominate every headlines, and historically and traditionally, faith takes a back seat, but not this year. In 2020, while the nation will be dividing, the church will be uniting, setting aside its logos, its labels, and its egos, marching into the communication capital of the world. If you think about it, the primary author and source of destruction, despair, to humanity and beginning to put on the greatest display of outrageous love that has ever been demonstrated before. 20,000 missionaries serving the city with one million hours of service, going over to the stadium and actually turning that stadium into a studio so millions of people can what? Watch and encounter the love of Jesus. I believe God wants to take his word back, the word that he created. Right now, if we were to go across America, the cross often equals hate, and the church is not known for love, but this is the very thing that us as the body of Christ was supposed to be known for. He said, you'll know that you're my, my disciples because you love one another. And as other communities and individuals are trying to hijack this word, distort this word, dilute this word, God's saying, I want to make sure that I go on record that our nation knows exactly what love is all about, and it's the love of our Father God. Come on, somebody. So I know they have an outrageous goal of, of mobilizing 200 people from all of your campuses. And if you're interested, we got a booth in the back, but you could actually text in. Uh, if you're a nappy, you're watching now, text in just 555-888. I think we got something on the screen. I don't know. They're just telling me what to do. But if you're interested and you want to be a part of the change, if you think about the, the man that we're honoring today, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. is no longer here, which means it's our turn. He did what God called him to do, and he's no longer here. So it's our turn to actually take our place and take our, our moment on this grand stage of human history and begin to leave the mark that God designed all of us to do. Is anyone ready to do something incredible? Come on, let's just put our hands together one more time. All right, I got a word uh, for you guys tonight. Are you ready? And there's only one requirement for those of you who don't know me. Uh, there, there's only one requirement for tonight, and, and it's super simple. And it's really founded in, in a scripture uh, in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, I believe, 120. It's, if you don't get anything from tonight, this, this will help you. This will be something you could take home. It's a, a very famous statement, but he says these words. It says, all of God's promises, all of God's promises are yes in Christ Jesus. 
The good news is, is that no matter where you've been in life or what you've been doing, everything God's promised you, everything God's promised your family, your finances, your life, your legacy, your children, your children's children, everything he's promised you, he's already said yes to. He's not pondering. He's not wondering. He's not hoping you'll do something to be worthy of his promises being fulfilled. The Bible says that everything he's promised you, he's already said yes to, but there's a contingency. It says, and with our amen. Which means tonight, or every time that you hear the word being communicated, God's promises are not looking for your assessment, they're simply looking for your agreement. So often we move into an environment like this, and let's just be honest, we put our arms back and say, how could that be possible for me? Or, or, or I don't think you're communicating to me, Jedediah. But the reality is, is that God is just simply not looking for your assessment, but your agreement. And if you were to be honest, God and the enemy are actually battling for the same thing in your life every day. When you wake up every morning, you're actually in a battle for your agreement. Are you going to agree with what you see or what God has said? Are you going to agree with the pain of your past or the plan of his promise? Are you going to agree with the sheer shame and your sin or your savior and your salvation? Every day, there's a battle for your agreement. So tonight, if there's something being released that's truth to you, I encourage you to not stand back and assess it, but simply agree with it. Which means when we say amen, it's not a hype thing, it's a holy thing. You're not putting a period at the end of a prayer, but you're putting an exclamation point at the beginning of a declaration saying, so be it, I'm in agreement and alignment. Let that live in my life right now. And I just wanna encourage you, go ahead and just test it. You might not used to be agreeing with it, you might used to just being assessing it, but I just want you to test it tonight. Set aside your, your, your discouragement. Set aside your perspectives. Set aside what you've been dealing with and just say, you know what, God, tonight I'm just simply going to respond with a loud, outrageous amen. All right, we're going to be good. That's the rules for tonight. That's it. Anyone got their Bibles? Any real believers in here brought the genuine leather tonight? We got any Bibles tonight? Let's go with me quickly to our primary passage, Second. Or excuse me, Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3. Anyone got your Bibles? Anyone got the real genuine leather, like you got a case? Hold it up. You've been carrying that thing around. Look at these real Christians. Come on, hold it. Just look at that guy with the case and the highlighters on it. Hey, if you got your Bible, hold it up, hold it up, hold it up. Now keep it up if you're single. Look around, look around. Yep, you're believing for a miracle. You're welcome, 2020. Don't grab your friend's Bible. She's, <laughs> I just watched. Give me that. I need a man. Come on, get your own Bible. Exodus, Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. If you're not there, it's on the screen. I'm going to be reading from the never incorrect version, also known as the NIV, Exodus chapter 3. And I encourage you, we're going to be spending some time in Exodus 3 and 4 in the old T. Do your biblical due diligence. Go home, read this passage of scripture, these, these two chapters, and I believe it's going to speak to you. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. It says, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people. Notice for a second how personal God makes this moment. It's so beautiful. It says, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to do, to rescue. Who's going to come down? Yeah, it's so beautiful. I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Prezrites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Thank God we started naming our cities different names. <laughs> and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Verse 10, one more time. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. If you're taking notes tonight, and I encourage you to do, it's biblically founded. You're more likely to get into heaven if you do take notes. I'm just joking. You might get to the gate and be like, show me your work, like a math problem. How did you get here? If you're, if you're if you're taking notes tonight, the title of this message, which I believe is inspired and divinely designed by God for you, it's two simple words. It's time. It's time. Touch two to three people gently, but with conviction and passion and say those words. It's time. It's time. It's, it's time. Can I pray with you tonight as we get started? Father God, I just thank you that you're in the room. The Bible tells us that when we worship you, you inhabit the praises of your people. 
which means tonight as we've worshiped you by driving here, worshiped you by creating space and our time to honor you, worshiped you with our words, worshiped you with our tithes and offerings as we worship you, the infinite one who time cannot contain, the guard who carved the heaven with a breath is not standing off at a distance. You've actually left the throne rooms in heaven and you've invaded this place tonight, which means the king of kings, the reigning champion of humanity, the undefeated one is in the building. And when you show up, everything changes. When you show up, sickness and disease right now has to leave bodies. When you show up, chaos and calamity has to become crystal clear. When you show up, there is peace and joy and love and hope and grace and mercy, which means no matter what we're dealing with or facing, we've encountered the face of the king that can change everything. So we give you permission, Holy Spirit, to do what only you can do. Move into every heart, penetrating lives back to purpose, back to promise, back to your dream and your design. God, I declare that everything in here that's dead, that's supposed to be alive, would come back to life in Christ Jesus. And as always, God, I pray that I would not be a man that stands on a platform and becomes famous, but I would be the man tonight that becomes a platform that you stand on and are made famous tonight. When we leave here, we may not talk about any man, but only God. In Jesus Christ alone, we give you all the honor, all the praise, and God, please help the 49ers win the Super Bowl. And all God's people said, you know, speaking of football, segue, just joking. You know, I grew up a basketball player. Like my whole life, all I did was play one sport. I was a missionary's kid, lived in 100 homes before I was 25. Real story. It's my pain. And, uh, but I was a basketball player. I played basketball my whole life. And I was actually this height when I was 14 years old. I was about 110 pounds. So I was like Skeletor. People used to call me Circus Freak. Extremely unattractive. A few things have changed. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just joking. Who, sa- who says that? You'll never invite me back. Um, you know, but I played basketball my whole life. And my parents uh, relocated to Hawaii my, my sophomore year in high school. And I started quickly being heavily recruited to play football. And, and not just play football, but play football on the varsity team. And not just to like be a practice dummy, but to actually start on this team. And not just start on this team, but start both ways, offense and defense. And it wasn't because I was like a diamond in the rough or I had this athletic ability or gifting or skill set. It was simply because it was an extremely small Christian school and they needed to field a football team. I had no business putting these pads on. So consequently, we lost. Every game. Ever. Okay. Like not that year, like ever, like it, the history of the program when I joined the team had never won one single game ever. Yeah, you're cruel. That's mean. Decades of playing football and they never, ever went And to be honest, some of it was because we were trying to make something super practical, supernatural. Like if I could be honest, and this is not the message, but I remember us praying instead of practicing. Like, that's the stuff crazy Christians used to do in the back of the day. Like, we were having, like, prayer meetings as a football team, and I'd be like, I feel like we got to figure out these plays. Like, I remember doing a Jericho march around the stadium. No joke. Like, we're marching around, like, with our football jerseys on, and I was like, did you read the story? Like, what do we want to happen at the end of this Jericho march? It's like, everyone going to die, and the stadium's going to crumble, and, you know, like, we had a prayer tent, like, for, at the game. We had a prayer tent, like a full-blown tent with all the old G's in there and tambourines and praying. And like that would go on the entire game. So we never, ever, ever won a game. And it was really hard to win because we're making bad teams winners. Because as long as you didn't lose to us, you could be 0-9. But as long as you didn't lose to our school, you were still a winner. So people were training for us like it was their Super Bowl. So it was my sophomore year, and we win our first game. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Goodbye. I love you guys. Great night. We win our first game. Now, you need to understand, like, the place goes crazy pandemonium. Like, just imagine, I want you to be multiple people in this scenario. There's the fans who are normal, logical people, you know, from other schools watching this with their families. And then there's us, the prayer tent people who have never, ever won a game in the history of the program. And all of a sudden we win and we go ballistic. Like there's multiple Gatorade bucket tosses. People are rich, ripping their pads off. The prayer tent literally goes into revival and breaks out. Chauffeurs come out. All of a sudden a white stallion comes out of the corner. There's a thing on it. Lightning bolts start coming down from heaven. You 
hear God's voice, these are my son who I'm well pleased. People start doing Billy Graham altar calls, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We're going ballistic. Like none of that is a lie either. Maybe the lightning bulb, but none of it's a lie. And in the middle of all of this, shirts being ripped off, Gatorade buckets tossed, lightning bolts from heaven, stallion running across. In the midst of all this, our coach yells, act like you've been here before. <laughs> yells, it, yells it twice. Act like you've been here before. And we all freeze and we're like, you? Did, have, we, we've never been here before because we've never won in the history of the program. And coach, neither of you, because you've been the coach for every losing season. Like we don't know what to do with our hands. We had no reference point for winning. We had no reference point for victory. We actually only knew what it was like to lose. We only knew what it was like to experience defeat after every game. We had no reference point for victory, for winning, for overcoming, for a comeback. So we had no reference point. And we look at this passage of scripture, if you're here tonight and maybe you've never been in a worship atmosphere like this, maybe you don't even understand the passage of scripture that I've been reading or who the primary subjects are in the narrative, you need to understand that the story we looked at in Exodus is a story of God's people and God's about to do something very unique. He's about to deliver them, but it's not what he's about to, just that he's going to deliver them, it's what he's about to deliver them from. When we look at this moment in history, God's chosen people have spent not four years in slavery, not 40 years in slavery, but 400 years in slavery. I want you to get that, 400 years in bondage, 400 years in oppression, 400 years of never owning anything, 400 years of never being able to give your kids an inheritance. If you were to actually go through the generations that come, 13 generations would have come and gone before this moment in time, and there would have been no heroes in Israel's day. They would never look at my great-grandfather, my great-grandfather, and say, he did this. They had 400 years of never experienced God's promise come to pass, 400 years of never leading, 400 years of never conquering, 400 years of never winning, 400 years of losing. They had no reference point of seeing God's word come to pass, no reference point of a prayer being answered, no reference point of standing in a divine moment saying this is what God had promised 400 years of defeat. And what's amazing about this moment is that everything's going to change, but it's not going to change because the people wanted it to. I want you to get this. There wasn't a group of people gathering on a Saturday night by the thousands worshiping and praising. There, there wasn't a group of people, a remnant, saying, hey, we're launching more campuses. We're about to take Oakland, and we're about to take Natomas, and, and we're about to be in more prisons. There wasn't yeah, a discover class where you could discover your purpose and find freedom and learn how to make a difference. These things were not taking place. Nothing changed in the people of God. The only thing that changed, and I want you to get it, this is the primary reason I'm here, to deliver this word. The only thing that changed is God heard their cries, God saw their pain, he stepped into the divine timeline and said, that's enough, it is time for you to be delivered. It wasn't because they were willing, it wasn't because they wanted it, it wasn't because they're ready, it was simply because God showed up and said, it is time. And I came here tonight as we start 2020 to let this clarion call out to each and every one of your hearts, your homes, and your lives that God wants you to know it is time. No, Jedediah, what are you saying? I'm saying it's time for your life. It's time for your family. It's time for what God has promised. It's time for your business. It's time for your prodigals to come home. It's time for radical conversions. It's time for the state of California. It's time for our nation. It's time for everything that you've been dreaming of, hoping for, and wishing in comes to pass. God wants you to know it is time. And here's what you need to know. When God says it's time, it's such a smart room. It's unbelievable. When God says it's time, it's time. It's just how simple it works. When God says it's time, it's time. 
Well, well Jedediah, I've never seen breakthrough before, but God says it's time. But Jedediah, my, my grandma's still sick, but God says it's time. But Jedediah, I still got debt, but God says it's time. But Jedediah, I don't even have a consecutive streak on my version app, but God says it's time. But Jedediah, I'm not even fasting and on the pursuit fast with everyone else, but God says it's time. You need to understand that when God says it's time, it doesn't matter if you're ready. All that matters is if you're willing and God's making a clear move in this city, in this state, in this nation, going on record saying it is time. Come on, touch two to three people with confidence and conviction and say it is time. And listen, I don't care what your reference point is. That was a moment where you might have started to assess how could he. But you don't need to assess it. We simply need to agree with it. And when God says it's time, what I love about our God is that God has chosen to operate on the planet through humanity. So when God says it's time for a people group, when God says it's time for a city, when God says it's time for a community, when God says it's time for a state, when God says it's time for a nation, he always begins to pick a person. See, I believe every time God wants to solve a problem, he creates a person. Which means before he ever formed humanity, before he ever placed a star in the sky, before he ever gave, you know, humans existence, before he ever breathed on dirt and gave meaning to motion, this God looked at this moment in time. He looked at 2020 and says, who do I need to be in the conversation? Who do I need to be in existence? You think you got a problem? You need to understand you're a problem for your problems. Like you're sitting there going, look at the political crisis. Look at the conversation of the day. Look at what the news saying. What are we going to do? And God says, I know what I'm going to do. I made you and I sent you because you're a solution to the problem. In fact, you are God's dream that he wanted to be seen manifest. So he wrapped it in flesh so that it could become a reality. I'm gonna say that again because you missed it. I'm not talking about the people on the stage. I'm not talking about the people in the front row. I'm talking about every human being alive in this room tonight. You need to understand you were God's dream yeah. that he wanted to see come into existence so bad that he wrapped his dream in flesh yeah. so that his dream could become manifest. You might be saying, well, Jedediah, you don't understand. Like, uh, I was a mistake. I was an accident. My parents didn't want me. My dad abandoned me. Like, yeah, I, I get it. You weren't your parents' idea. You were God's idea. You didn't, you didn't come. You didn't come from your parents. You came through your parents. You were, you were God's idea. You know, I have an adopted sister, and her mom was a, a crack addict prostitute, schizophrenic, manic depressive, like that was her biological mother. And she often struggled with being wanted. And I looked at her and I said, Elima, you know, God wanted you so bad. God needed you to be in existence so much that he did not care if the vessel was willing. He didn't care if the vessel wanted you. He had to bring you into existence. Some of you came through horrible individuals, but you're God's original idea that he did not care what the circumstance looked like. He had to give birth to you so that his dream could become manifest in this moment in time. You're a problem for your problems. And in this story, God picks, he picks Moses. Many of you might not know Moses' journey, but a few things we do know about him is that one, Moses was an immigrant. He was living in a foreign land. He was an orphan. His mother eventually raised him, but she did throw him in a basket, send him down a river. She had to let him go. He quickly grows up and he becomes a murderer. Any murderers in here? There's always a few, like just a couple. <laughs> Lights low, moment between me and God, just a, so in the back left. Dave in the back left, just joking. <laughs> if you don't raise your hand for being a murderer, you're already more qualified than Moses. Moses is a runaway. He's an outlaw. He's an outcast. When we pick up on him in this moment with God, he is hiding in the desert, working for his father-in-law. It's not the best job occupation. I love my father-in-law, but I'm not working for him. No way. Here's what I want you to get. Moses was trying not to be picked. He wasn't in a discovery class. He didn't join a group. He wasn't on the leadership team. He, he wasn't showing up to any services regularly or once every four weeks. He was doing none of that. He was trying not to be picked. You know who I'm talking to tonight? The people in the room that have been hiding in the room, trying not to be picked. 
You're just hoping God doesn't tap your shoulder. You're just hoping you don't get called out on. You're just hoping that you don't have to step one moment towards lost people or broken people or hurting people. And for some reason, you don't feel qualified. You can relate with Moses. He was not trying to be picked. What I've known about God is he picked the people who don't always want to be picked. This is the good news about our God. Do you know that? He specializes in building with the broken. He specializes in accepting the unacceptable and doing the exceptional. He does the phenomenal with the nominal and the extraordinary with an ordinary. He is the master of taking broken pieces and making masterpieces. The shard, fragment, and fractured pieces of your life begins to put together this beautiful mosaic so that his glory can shine through. Moses was not trying to be picked. And God shows up and he begins to pick them. And the reason why I want to highlight this passage of story is many, many of us would say these words, man, if God would just speak to me audibly, I'd do it. Anyone say that? Like, God, if that guy comes off the stage and he gives me that prophetic word and it's, it's written, you know, in calligraphy and you've burned the edges and you hand deliver it to me at 2.15 a.m., I'm going to wake up, God, and if you give me that, if I could just hear your voice, if you could just give me a sign, if you would just begin a burning bush, like if you could just do a burning bush thing, For those of you who know the narrative, Moses is standing in front of a burning bush that's burning but not burning. And he actually hears the audible voice of God. I've seen the pain of my people. I've heard their cries. I'm going to deliver them. Moses, now go. And we would think if that happened to us, we'd be like, all right, sign me up. I'm coming. You know what Moses says? I love it. He begins to debate with the creator. We can relate. Moses goes, why me? Who am I? If you actually look at the passage of Scripture in Exodus 3.11, it says, who am I that I should go? In Jedediah's vernacular in 21st century you know, context, he's literally saying, why me? And let's just be honest. When God picks you, we say those words, why me? And we say it for two reasons. One, we want God to identify a quality or capacity inside of us of why we're being picked. Why me, God? For the worship team? You heard me sing in the shower. You know, I can hit that high note. Yeah, all right, I get it. Why me? Why me, God? Because I'm beautiful and gifted and tall and talented. Is that why you're picking me, God? Why me, God? You see me, my energy, my finances. You want me to be the CEO of everything? Why why me, God? Because of my creative gifting, you've seen me paint or draw or write or or, or you've seen my Instagram posts. Why me for the social media team? Why me, God? Go ahead, tell me. Why me? Or we say why me because we absolutely don't think we're qualified. I got nothing to give, I got nothing to offer, I got nothing to say, I got no talent, I got no time, I got no gifting, why me? Whatever posture, position you find yourself in tonight, what I love is that God gives the same answer to either conversation. Look at God's response to Moses. Moses says, who am I that I should go? Verse 12 of Exodus 3, God says, I will be with you. Do you notice God doesn't even answer his question? It's kind of the point. Why me, God? God's response. Because of me, Moses. Why me, God? I'll be with you. What is he saying? It actually doesn't have anything to do with you. Your gifting, your skill set, your ability, your time, your talent. Why me? Because of me. Why are you using me? Because of God. Why are you blessing me? Because of God. Why am I accelerating my business? Because of God. Do you not understand? It's not about us. It's always been and will always be about God. Why me? Because of me. Then Moses' response. We think that'd be enough. I'm going to just fast forward through this. You can put the verses on the screen for time. It says, why me? God says, because of me. Then Moses says, what will I say? God's beautiful response, I'll tell you. <laughs> then he says, well, what if they don't believe me? Do your biblical due diligence. This is God's 21st, this is Jedediah's 21st century edition. What if they don't believe God says, I'll show up. Then Moses' response, well, I've never been, if you actually read it, it's the most eloquent response to God about how we can't communicate adequately. He says, I've, actually, let's just read it. It's just so good. I just want you to see this. Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow. I mean, it sounds so beautiful, right? I never have, neither will be. The quadrilates of the sun evaporates the mitochondrian wall. Like he's just going on this another layer of language. Pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent of speech, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. God's response, who gave human beings their mouths? Just 
Just look at the narrative. Why me? Because of me. What will I say? I'll tell you. What if you don't believe? I'll show up. Well, I can't talk. Cool, I make mouths. <laughs> what is God trying to communicate to us right now tonight? You have no excuse. Well, I can't speak. Well, that's awesome. I can make mouths. Well, I have a hard time thinking. Great. I've given you the mind of Christ. Well, I'm inferior and, and I don't have a lot of courage. Great. But when the spirit of God comes upon you, you have boldness and courage. You, you know, well, well, I feel alone. Well, I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. Well, well you don't understand. I, I, I'm not great with my finances. Great. I'm going to bless you with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Well, I, I don't have power. I don't have authority. Well, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, that, that same spirit that took him off the cross and took him out of the grave that same power lives inside of every single one of you, which means there's no reason for you to have an excuse. Why me? Because I'm, well, I'm me. I'm weak, God. I can't do it. Great. My strength's perfected in weakness. Like that, that's the, when where you're weak is where I'm actually at my best. There's no excuse for any of us tonight to say no to God's calling. After this intense debate with the creator audibly, which we think we would all respond instantly, Moses says these words, please choose someone else. And he leaves the conversation. <laughs> Which means, friend, it's not going to be a prophetic word or it's not going to be a Shekinah glory cloud or it's not going to be the fact that you go home and there's a letter slipped under your door. You're finally called. You need to understand if you're alive today, God's chosen you. <laughs> See, when God says it's time, it's time. And when God says it's you, it's Come on, when God says it's you, it's it's you. Which means each and every one of you tonight have been handpicked by God for this specific moment in human history. The question if it's not you, the question is, is will you say yes? The most powerful part of this story is we get ready to close is Exodus 4:20. It's an overlooked passage of scripture, no one really pays attention to it. But remember, he leaves the conversation with the creator saying no. Exodus 4.20, it says, And Moses grabbed his kids, his family. He loaded up his donkey. And he headed towards destiny. Somewhere in this dialogue, somewhere in the distance between that conversation with the Creator, Moses moved his no to God, his how to God, his maybe to God, to a very reluctant yes to God. And because of his reluctant yet, yes, a group of people who spent 400 years of slavery now are about to enter into freedom. Because of his very small reluctant yes to God, we see some of the most outrageous, incredible signs and wonders take place where the invisible God proves his power to a visible Pharaoh. Because of his reluctant yes to God, we see a group of people move a generation into the promised land and we begin to occupy. A group of people who spent 400 years building and burden are now inheriting in promise. My question for you tonight, friend, is what is waiting for you and beyond you, behind your reluctant yes to God? I'm not talking about those that have already said yes in the room. I'm talking to those in the room that have said, how, God? Why me, God? Maybe, God. Don't think you can do it, God. I'm talking to those that have been simply, no matter what evidence you've seen, no matter what experiences you've had in a service, no matter what words from God have been spoken physically or jumped off the pages of scripture, somehow have just not said yes. And the question I'm asking you tonight is what is waiting for you on the other side of your yes? You might be saying, well, I've never led before, but God's saying it's you. You might be saying, I've never seen a miracle answered before, but God's saying it's you. You might be saying, I've never even prayed out loud. God's still saying it's you. I've never seen someone far from God come to Christ. God's still saying it's you. You might be saying, I don't even like people. <laughs> God's still saying it's you. The question is, will you simply say yes to him? God does not need you to be capable. He just needs you to be available. And what I've come to realize is that when there's more yeses than noes in any room, that is my definition of revival. If you wanna know what revival is, it's not a physical manifestation, it's not an extended worship set. Revival is when there's more agreement than disagreement. Yeah. 
which means as we start this new decade, can we move from how or why or who or what to simply say yes?